Fantastic. So welcome everyone to the first episode of Delve Deeper, the MASTS 2024 webinar series that delves into the depths of marine science research. I am your host, Phil Bell Young, and today we are diving into the economics of marine plastic pollution management, hoping to shed some light on the pressing issues, benefits and impacts of this global phenomenon and have a discussion on how cooperative management in the North Atlantic could influence future negotiations of global plastic treaties. So not to waste any more time, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Uh, he has an expertise that lies in the intersection between economics and environmental policy. His research is not only advances our understanding of environmental markets, but also offers practical solutions for addressing pressing environmental changes. Joining us now from the University of Aberdeen, please give a very warm virtual welcome for Professor Franz Dorries. Right. Thank you, uh, Phil, for the first introduction. I assume you can hear me all OK, right? I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks. So thanks again for the uh, very, very kind invitation to uh, to speak and exciting webinar that you're uh, that you're organizing. Uh, so when Phil initially uh, uh, approached me a few weeks ago, I thought, well, maybe the um, economics of marine plastic pollution that we have been working on as part of an interdisciplinary team is very suitable for uh, for today's audience and, and, and is very suitable for the uh, for the webinar series that you have under the uh, under the header of MAST. So what I will um, use the time for is basically to give you a kind of overview of uh, a big ESRC project that we have been uh, running over the past four years or so and i'm listening here my uh, collaborators um, which are economists but also marine modelers and you saw already nick henley a bit in the virtual, virtual audience as well who's one of my collaborators on this so i will use this kind of platform to kind of say a bit about this kind of project that we have been working on again over the past uh, four years or so and where we are right now and what we can uh, learn from this whole uh, marine plastics uh, pollution issue from an economics perspective but more importantly how this is of relevance for uh, the current uh, international negotiations that are uh, happening as we speak with respect to uh, the instigation and, and development of this global plastic treaty that the united nations is, is currently working on um, for uh, for dealing with this global uh, pollution issue but beyond that, beyond summarizing some of the, the results from, from this work and, and why economics can hopefully uh, provide some, some input in, in these negotiations, I'll also talk a bit beyond this specific uh, project and uh, share some other insights that, uh, that some other literature, economic literature, might also be, uh, be useful for, uh, for kind of, yeah, informing us about how these uh, negotiations and how these uh, international discussions concerning um, setting up this this global plastic treaty how this might uh, be shaped in, in the future and i think ultimately what the message will will tell us is like it, it it's a it, it's a big beast this kind of global plastic treaty and it's it's a complex issue as well and i think uh, we're far uh, from kind of reaching some kind of consensus which is also what we've seen in the in the past few months or so where the negotiations essentially uh, halted a bit and got a bit stuck so I will share some um, insights from the economic science on that. But that said, it's an interdisciplinary project, as we will see. Um, and as a kind of background, I want to let's start with marine plastic pollution. But we want to start with a very old problem, um, which was uh, the issue of acid rain in the in the 1980s. And I grew up and I was educated in the Netherlands, and also the Dutch had issues with. Uh, acid rain uh, uh, problems uh, coming from sulfur dioxide emissions that were originating in, in Germany, for example, but elsewhere in Europe as well, uh, we, there was this massive uh, environmental problem in the context uh, of, of acid rain because of sulfur emissions from, uh, from the energy intensive industry, in particular power plants. We saw these uh, power plants emitting sulfur, sulfur emissions and then Sulfur emissions were, were originated and then were transported through the wind and were deposited somewhere else um, in, in a different country. So it's important to kind of 
understand this kind of mobility of the pollutant. And as we will see, um, when Nick Henley and I started talking about this, this years ago, I think in 2017 or early 2018, looking at this acid rain problem where it matters where you are and which country emits what and what kind of fraction of the pollution is being transported through um, wind, in this case somewhere else, matters in terms of how you tackle the problem. And we will see that the same kind of structural features apply to the to the issue of, uh, of marine plastic pollution. So the acid rain problem we're going to take, as we will see in, in a few minutes, as well as a kind of a template. And we're going to use that and, and morph this into the application of, of marine plastic pollution and see what kind of similarities there are, but also what kind of uh, differences there are with respect to sulfur dioxide emissions. I think the nature of the pollutant, uh, as we will see, will also uh, be, be is an issue in terms of uh, finding out of how this pollutant actually behaves across space and what this does in terms of the incentives that countries might have to deal with the, the, the to deal with cleaning up plastics or not. So, in a, in a nutshell, it kind of um, yeah shapes the incentives for countries. Um, with respect to how they, they are going to approach this whole negotiation process. And Carl Gerlin Merler, he's a, he was a famous Swedish environmental economist. He was the first one to kind of put this whole acid rain problem and the kind of mobility of sulfur dioxide emissions, as I mentioned, in a kind of game theoretical framework. And this is also what we're going to deploy in the case of marine plastic pollution. So that is the background setting, the acid rain problem structurally the same as I, as I try to explain. Moving forward in time, now we see this whole uh, plastics in the oceans. Um, although it's not really a, a new environmental problem, it was already on the radar I think, 40, 50 years ago. But somehow I think in the last five to 10 years, it really came back on the, uh, on the academic radar and also more particularly in, in, in the policy arena. So we see plastics everywhere, right? And if you see this yellow arrow here, this is somewhere where I live. I live close to the wetlands. Uh, and even though that we see all the plastics accumulating in the, in the oceans worldwide, it's everywhere. So where I live, close to a river and close to this kind of fourth estuary, that's also where you see plastics. It's everywhere. So it affects everybody, essentially. There's no escaping from this, uh, from this pollutant anymore. So it's a global pollutant. Right, it's a problem as uh, we are all pretty uh, aware of. It 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 has economic uh, impacts in terms of uh, fishing. It might affect tourism uh, in an adverse way. If we see all the kind of plastics on beaches and stuff, it might affect coastal communities. Something that Phil and I already talked about in uh, just before before the talk. It might affect wildlife. Wildlife being uh, tangled into um, fishing nets and and. and digesting plastics, uh, but also more recently, there is also more concerns about uh, to what extent the kind of microplastics, the buoyant uh, plastics that we will see, that we see in the oceans, how this kind of um, morphs into kind of more micro uh, plastics and how this um, might be bad for for uh, for human health uh, concerns. So there's also this kind of way of how the pollutant might yeah, transform over time from a macro kind of plastic into a more microplastic. And this then also affects not only the environment, but also potentially human health. And that is also a big issue of, uh, of research uh, as we speak, but also a lot of uncertainty with respect to the actual uh, human health implications. Something I'm going to talk about at the end of, uh, of this talk as well. So the other feature is that marine plastic pollution is mobile. I already gave you the example of sulfur dioxide emissions, where sulfur was being kind of transferred across uh, domestic waters through wind. Also, of course, when plastic enters uh, rivers in the seas and subsequently the oceans, the ocean currents and the wind carry plastic across uh, nations' waters. And this also, this kind of mobility uh, affects how, um, yeah, how much damage countries are incurring from the, the, the plastic pollution. In short, it matters where you are. If I am a country who is emitting, say, relatively large chunk of, of plastics into the sea, subsequently um, in, into the oceans, if most of my plastic is moving elsewhere, say from the UK into the direction of Norway, 
right? It's Norway who's incurring relatively larger damages than the UK as a main emitter, for example. And you may guess that in this case, Norway has also a big incentive or bigger incentive to kind of do something about the problem, right? Because they are incurring uh, the damages from uh, relatively larger damages from, from pollution. If the UK is, most of the pollution is, is being emitted and goes somewhere else, the UK might have a lower incentive to kind of clean up their, uh, their, their, their plastic pollution. And as we will see this kind of how mobile the plastic is and, and how this moves about in, in the ocean, and in our case, we're focusing on the North Atlantic, matters in terms of the kind of distribution of, of the cost, but also the distribution of the benefits across space. And this subsequently affects how these countries uh, go into these kind of negotiations and might uh, find a way to kind of come up with a common agreement. Fundamentally, economically speaking, the distribution of cost and benefits is uh, is fundamental in, in trying to tackle this problem. But then, again, this is just from a purely economic perspective. With respect to sulfur dioxide emissions in the context of SRA that I mentioned, if we're going to think about this in terms of plastics, it's different in the sense that um, there's much more uncertainty with respect to the environmental damages from, from plastic because it is much more mobile than, than sulfur. It might, for example, that as I mentioned, there's plastics from the UK being emitted into the North Sea and that moves up to Norway. The plastic might stay in, Nor in, in Norwegian um, waters for one or two months. And then over time, it might move somewhere else, right? For example, to the US or Canada. So there's also this kind of temporary nature of, of, of pollution damage, if you will, uh, across across space. So it's not a kind of stationary um, point of, of pollution. It, it stays mobile up to a certain degree, and in the long run, it might be accumulated in all these kind of five international gyres that I'm just uh, highlighting here in the uh, in this picture there. So, as I mentioned, there is this asymmetry in terms of the distribution of damages and the cost, and also, the, the, yeah, this this also impacts on on how asymmetric the distribution of the potential benefits are of cleaning up plastic emissions in your domestic waters, and how this subsequently affects the overall outcome of the negotiations. So that's going to be key, as we will see. And it's this kind of asymmetry and this kind of heterogeneity in terms of cost and benefits, where it's also kind of natural to to kind of find out that there is gains from international cooperation. That is nothing new, right? So there's definitely more gains, economically speaking, as well, to be made if you and I coordinate on reducing, in this case, uh, marine plastic pollution, compared to the situation where you and I just do things unilaterally, where I, independently from what you're doing, I do my own uh, cleanup and you do your own cleanup as well, independent of what I'm doing, right? So typically, we, are, we know, economically speaking, that if you and I coordinate our emissions reduction efforts, we can get more out of it. We can get higher degrees of, uh, of of emissions reductions and typically at lower costs. So coordination does matter. And I think in this sense, it's, it, it, it justifies why the, why the United Nations is really pushing forward to kind of having this kind of global uh, treaty on reducing marine plastic pollution because coordination matters and typically you can get that. So, there is nothing new under the sun. I think what is the tricky point here is that how you go about, again, the distribution of the, of the benefits and costs, uh, depending on, on where you are. So it was a historic day when the United Nations um, uh, were thinking about um, developing this, this global plastic treaty. Um, but also there, if you think about uh, what happened the last uh, few months, or uh, it really got to a bit of a halt, right? So the expectations were uh, were a bit tempered um, and, and not as uh, enthusiastic as they were um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and we can talk about that. In the so what were the questions uh, that we were uh, looking at in this uh, project? Again, uh, well, just to highlight, this was funded by the ESRC, so I want to acknowledge that as well. We want to first to find out how does plastic move about between countries. And as I mentioned, we were focusing on the North Atlantic as a case study um, because we had relatively good data on that uh, on that aspect. And once we know how this framework could be applied in the context of the North Atlantic, we could potentially apply this to other 
regions as well, such in, 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 in China, for example. We want to find out what an optimal agreement actually means in terms of, of, of plastic abatement and what are the potential economic gains from international cooperation on plastic. And also find out once we have this kinds of this 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 this, this kind of optimum that we can achieve, what if there's some kind of political economy uh, kinds of constraints on the agreement um, that might affect how the distribution of the costs and benefits uh, might, might might be altered. Because even though economically we can find out what, if we all cooperate on, 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 on a single goal, how much we can achieve, in reality, this might not be the case. Because of, again, where you are, and what your location essentially is. Now here is, uh, what is the fundamental driver, I believe, um, uh, in this project is is how plastics move about in the in the ocean and it is application in the North Atlantic Ocean. And we were uh, teaming up with uh, colleagues from the Plymouth uh, Marine Laboratory um, and the marine modeler in in this project has done a huge amount of work trying to find out how the how the plastics are being moved in in the different um, across the different nations that are, that is embedded in this uh, in this in this North Atlantic region, I think we had about 17 countries in this uh, in this case study, and on the left hand side you basically see a simulation to see how the plastics originating from the UK and and, and the Netherlands and Germany how this basically spreads across space in this North Atlantic region. And if you're gonna we're gonna let this uh, simulation run for for quite a while, you see really see how this is is being affected in the in the whole uh, North Atlantic or North Atlantic Ocean. So I know we were looking at buoyant plastics, so plastics that we can actually see um, in, yeah, floating in the in the ocean. So we're, this is not a study about microplastics, just as a side note. And trying to find out how the plastics move about in the ocean, as I mentioned, is important to understand because this drives the whole economic model as well, uh, as we will um, explain in, in a few minutes. You need to understand where the plastics originate from, that is, which countries, and what kind of fraction that countries are emitting, what kind of fraction is moving elsewhere, right? So you need to have an understanding how potentially, yeah, the, the, the environmental damages um, map out across space. And this is important for, for international negotiation. You want to have some kind of understanding how these damages are being shaped across space, who generates these kinds of emissions, who incurs these kinds of uh, damages, and, and how this is being shaped over time. And this is basically what is kind of represented by this kind of transfer uh, matrix here on, on the right hand side. Can you see this? Yeah. So, in summary, based on this um, on the simulation of, of how the plastics move about in the North Atlantic. Here you see a graph that kind of shows um, the nations that that were involved in this region. It also shows a bit how the uh, how the ocean currents move about and how this shapes the kind of where the plastics subsequently end. And on, the, on these kind of all these kind of red dots shows the river emissions from the various nations that are involved in this study. And here you basically see a map that kind of summarizes the kind of mass concentration of plastics in this region, right? And uh, the more red the color is, the more dense the uh, the mass concentration is. So just to give you an idea of, based on this kind of plastic transfer matrix, how uh, how the maps um, of these kind of plastics movements and 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 the stock essentially in the end looks like uh, across these different nations in this in this region. And it matters, as we will see. Now, this is where you see. Um, a graph of the stock. This is the annual mean stock in 2014. These are the countries involved in this um, in this study, ranging from Belgium to the US. Basically shows how much plastic there is in their in their coastal waters, and also indicates from which country um, there these kinds of uh, uh, stock emissions or the emissions that enter up on their shores and and the beaches, where it comes from. Right, so you see a huge stock typically in the U.S. Watch country, Mexico occurs a lot of the damages. Haiti as well, Dominican Republic, and there's a bit of more kind of more even spread 
of, um, of emissions in, in the other countries. But the US, Mexico, and Haiti, and also the Dominican Republic are countries who are incurring um, typically in the long run um, potential damages because their actual stock of plastics on their shores and their coastal waters is typically uh, is relatively high. And here you see a figure that basically shows kind of which what the fraction is that countries export from their river emissions. Belgium exports relatively a lot. This is the fraction of plastics that, that move elsewhere once it's in the, in the water. Um, Sweden exports a lot. I mean export, I mean physically in terms of where the plastic uh, goes, right? Once it enters the, uh, the Swedish waters and then it's being transported somewhere else. So also here you see some kind of differences across um, nations in terms of how much plastic is being exported. But it kind of um, illustrates the point that location matters, where you are, and whether you're kind of a net emitter, and or whether you you kind of receive relatively um, a lot of emissions in in the long run. Now this is a kind of network-based diagram showing similar kinds of uh, of, of the things, uh, summarizing the, the preview results in 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 a slightly different way. All the countries involved. This is other waters. This is kind of we're beyond the exclusive economic zone because it's not that all plastics enter up at the nations in the nation's domestic uh, waters or coastal waters or on their beaches, right? It might also be that some of the, the plastic enters up in international waters without the uh, kind of, yeah, um, international uh, jurisdiction. Might just in the, say in the long run in these kind of uh, five gyres that I just highlighted at the beginning. Something uh, I think we should uh, maybe discuss in uh, later as well. To what extent these international waters, how this may affect the outcome of international negotiations, and I have my own own opinion uh, about that. Now, in terms of bringing this into uh, the workhorse of of economics, uh, so to speak, um, what does this mean? Well, we basically look at two different. Uh, kinds of settings. The first one is a setting where all these individual countries that are in the study, these 17 countries, um, we basically say, well, what if all these countries try to maximize their own net benefit function, right? So I'm from the Netherlands, that's my native home country. What would be the net benefit if the Dutch would kind of um, reduce emissions, implying there would be some kind of abatement of, 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 of plastics when this might incur some benefits, right? Because my uh, beaches will, will get cleaner, but also I will incur some, some cost of cleanup, right? The abatement cost summarized here. So we basically calculate the country's net benefit function as the benefit from reducing emissions minus the cost of reaching um, the kind of abatement um, actions. That's one case or kind of yeah benchmark if you will all countries are doing their own individual individual unilateral abatement actions emissions reductions actions and the other extreme we're kind of computing this kind of fully cooperative scenario and that's where we're going to calculate what if all nations all aggregated together what is the benefit then if they maximize this function right so what is the net benefit if all countries coordinate on, on, on abatement efforts. So we have these two extremes and then find out, okay, what are the differences? And of course, economic theory predicts that in the um, cooperative scenario, we can get much, uh, much, more, uh, much more economic gains. And this is basically what you see in this graph here. So this is the value from the policy, just a percentage of, of, of the gains that, that, that countries can get. Some are mostly are slightly above zero, a few, few negative here. The ones who can gain a lot in this case is, is the US and also Germany is a big one um, and France as well a bit. And I think in aggregate in the cooperative scenario, which is here highlighted in the red bar, we reach about 54%, I think, off the top of my head of, uh, of gains relative to the case where all countries unilaterally do their abatement efforts. So significant gains to be made, economically speaking, from international cooperation, 50 odd percent relative to the, uh, to, to the baseline. 
Now here's a graph just to summarize uh, essentially what uh, what countries will do in terms of actual actual abatement, right? And it's it's much more uh, scattered uh, across these different nations. Germany actually has negative emissions. The U.S. has negative emissions. Sweden has negative emissions, right? So it matters in terms of where you are. Um, U.S. for example, remember here's actually having negative emissions or negative abatement, implying that they were incurring a lot of the damages, right? So in the kind of cooperative scenario, you would like them to, uh, yeah, to be compensated uh, for that. But overall, I think in the cooperative scenario, we get about 62% um, uh, more abatement compared to uh, countries doing their own unilateral abatement actions. So again, cooperation matters. So in a nutshell, what we're doing in the study is basically we're trying to come up with a kind of general framework of, of game theory and, and try to find out how cooperation matters for uh, marine plastic uh, abatement in the North Atlantic and with the aim as well to potentially have this uh, being applied to other regions as well. And we find that there is significant gains from, from international cooperation typically, but also that the net benefits across these different countries uh, are, are unequally distributed. And I think this matters for um, for negotiations in general. You see this in general with a lot of the uh, the older environmental uh, international environmental agreements that, depending on, on on how the cost and benefits are shared or the net benefits, right, and who does the actual uh, effort in terms of cleaning up their 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 polluting emissions, matters for for the, these negotiations. If I need to kind of um, put in a relatively large share of my effort to reduce emissions, I might want to have some compensation for, for doing that, for example. And I think these things might pan into actual uh, international discussions. Now, I want to highlight beyond this kind of study, I want to briefly uh, touch on a few other things before we open the, the floor for discussion. And this is a recent study that we just kind of published a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Nature Scientific Reports, where we're looking at all past um, environmental uh, international environmental leg 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 legislation and some other international protocols. And what we basically found is that it's mainly environmental issues or environmental degradation, environmental pollution that was driving these 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 legislations and these protocols, not really human health concerns. So I want to raise this question because okay, because if we're starting to think about microplastics, which is also part of the Global Plastic Treaty, right? This might have potentially have an impact on human health. So is there, and this is why I have a question mark here, is there a way to kind of also have the human health impact alongside the environmental impact part of negotiations? Something to think about. Another thing that we found is that in most cases, or there's a high correlation at least, that we found that legislations were successful or, or negotiations were successful in the case there was a kind of sub, or, or a substitute available. Uh, for example, with the CFCs, um, in the case of the Montreal Protocol, they were phased out kind of radically, but it was also relatively easy to do because there was a viable substitute. There was a viable alternative that could be easily um, be put into place as this kind of substitute for, for CFCs. And there's a few other uh, examples as well. So what does this tell us for Plastic pollution, for example, right? We, we talk about, yeah, investing and, and trying to come up with kind of biodegradable plastics. Is that a viable substitute? There is, we, we, we have them, but if you look at the uptake of, of, of that, it's, it's not massive, right? And it's, it's not really scaled up as such. So again, a question mark, what does this imply for negotiations concerning uh, dealing with, uh, with plastic pollution? Now, if you look at this, if you talk about um, IAs, it's like often, especially when you want to develop substitutes, and there's some literature on, on that as well recently in Nature, where you, where they argue, well, we should kind of develop alternatives for for just plastic, although I think that's a challenge because plastic is it's it's very flexible, it's it's durable, and it's super cheap, right? So there you have economic properties that that make plastic very very attractive from an economic uh, perspective. So I think it's going to be a challenge to kind of develop fully compatible viable substitutes that also in, in an economic sense. But maybe we should stimulate R&D investment or in development of, of, of these alternatives and basically how these uh, alternatives subsequently are being transported uh, 
and then export it, uh, excuse me, um, across uh, domestic borders. And I have here a graph of the, um, of the ocean cleanup, which is essentially an end of pipe technology, right? So this, this technology really scoops up the plastic in, the, in these gyres and then moves it back to shore. It's one uh, technological solution, but not the only one, uh, probably. So maybe we also need to work more towards come up with more process integrated uh, type of, um, of solutions for uh, mitigating plastic pollution more generally. So is there a bit of an optimistic takeaway given that the latest uh, negotiations were uh, were halted a bit and, and we're kind of be more subject to a bit more, more pressure? Uh, I think one lesson from that was I think that it was much more narrower in focus in the sense that I think there was more, more emphasis on, on kind of waste management and, and waste recycling, that kind of a thing. But um, maybe we should kind of uh, think think broader. So there is some evidence for other uh, international protocols where we saw that actually, if you start thinking about a certain pollution problem, in this case plastics, and you see that nations are getting together and starting to negotiate on, on dealing with plastic pollution, you might expect that along the, 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 the way that there will be more stringent uh, regulation kicking in. And there's evidence that definitely innovators, the eco industry anticipates these kinds of future um, uh, developments. So often you see already that innovation is happening much earlier um, or before the actual, uh, when, when the actual agreements are being, being ratified and, and being yeah, sealed essentially. So I think there's a, this is a positive development, right? So I think the same is uh, applies here to, to plastics. And I think you definitely see um, there are some yeah, scanned evidence here and there that you see definitely more innovation going on in, in developing alternatives. So international cooperation, even though in this case you want to regulate plastic pollution as such, it has broader implications as well. Typically, you see knowledge transfers, transfers of, of, of technologies, abatement technologies across space. And these all also are, are I think, potential um, co-benefits beyond just regulating um, uh, pollution or plastics. So that's all I had to say. I think it's more than 20 minutes, Phil. But um, so apologies for, for slightly getting over, over schedule. But uh, this is where I end. And I think uh, leave it up to uh, for for uh, discussions thanks a lot thank you um <laughs> we're already getting some applause uh you can yes people are using the applause function which is amazing to see i'm just gonna take us out of spotlight uh i think i also noticed that i might have spotlighted myself through some of that as well so i do apologize if my uh face was on your screens quite a bit um well thank you so much there is so much to uncover here. So we are going into, well, to start with, I'll say we are going into a Q&A now. So if you have any questions, you can either use the raise hand function or you can write it in the comments or the Q&A section. Um, you are able in the Q&A section, I think, to write questions anonymously. I will remind you all that we are recording. Uh, so if you don't want to be in the recording and you, you would rather ask in the comments, please feel free to. Um, there's so much here and I definitely want to go back about international waters that you mentioned in your talk because that's something i've never really thought of like the responsibility like who takes responsibilities for plastic pollution in international waters um where i'd like to actually start with so you pointed out very nicely where you live which is clearly a coastal community there's always tension between uh conservation efforts and supporting economic growth so how do we strike that balance? So thinking of uh, marine plastic pollution and supporting economic growth, especially in these coastal communities that can sometimes be most affected by plastic pollution. Yeah, great question. It's um, it's also a tricky question because if you bring in economic growth uh, type of arguments in, the, in this, right, it's, uh, it's, it's it can be contentious. Um, but I think it, it it matters, right? Because if you in our study for the, the, that that uh, with Nick and 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 my other collaborators is like we were, for example, in one part of the study we were looking at the preferences, right, of um, of, of kind of cleaning up um, plastic pollution on, on 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 the beaches and in the coastal waters of the U.S. and, and the U.K. I think we had in, in that 
particular study. So, and we were mainly looking at the coastal waters and, and, and those living near the beaches, right? So their preferences to kind of go about cleaning up plastic emissions might be different from me living somewhere inland, right? Not close to, uh, to, to, to the shores and the beaches and, and the coastal waters. And I think it matters because the preferences of, if you bring this into kind of uh, coastal communities uh, types of settings, it, it might be different because if we're going, I think the, the challenge is how you go into map the preferences of the coastal communities who might have their own preferences of cleaning up their, 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 the plastic emissions versus a country's preferences towards dealing uh, with the, uh, with the plastic emissions. Right. And so again, location matters. Um, also here, I think it, 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 it might, Depend, right? If it might also be there's cases, and I think you mentioned this in the in the, in the preamble uh, when we were talking bilaterally that for some communities like in India, it, it's a bit of a market, right? For them, it's 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 a valuable product, if you will, to kind of catch the plastic and then sell it on or put it on into kind of recycling and bring it bring it somewhere else. Uh, although for for others, it might it might not be. Um, but again, I think to what extent this 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 mapping from preferences of of coastal communities map into kind of a country wise preferences is, is 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 relevant, of course, and especially if you as an individual country go into these kind of negotiations, it matters um, of well the preferences of coastal communities matter, but also preferences of other uh, citizens uh, should should matter equally as well, right? So it's um, it's tricky. Um, but anyway, this is just a quick thought on, on, on that issue. But to what extent this kind of really contributes to economic growth? Um, yeah, it, 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 you, you, can, you can think about this as well industry wide, right? It, because it, it, in the end, plastic is an oil based based product. If I have a strong incumbent industry, which is um, oil heavy or energy heavy, right? My, my preferences towards uh, that uh, dealing with plastics might be different than if I have a country with a relatively, uh, well, with a, with a less stronger uh, oil industry, right? So domestic stakes, economic stakes matter. And I think this is what you see in negotiations typically as well. Um, Short-term economic benefits, protecting your industries um, versus long-term environmental targets that you want to achieve um, in this case globally there's this kind of natural tension between these these two uh, two different things in my opinion so i do find it interesting talking about industry because i guess that comes back to the idea of who takes responsibility for it is it the people using the plastics or is it the people creating the plastics should companies like coca-cola be more financially invested or be more at the table in a at these treaties and at these conversations and negotiations, but not in a sense of to protect themselves, but to actually contribute towards this cleanup. It's yeah. especially now with the with microplastics, which you spoke about briefly, uh, and even more so nanoplastics, where we're actually seeing these now within our food chain and food supply. Is this something where we need to turn around and actually the policy? looks at these industries and corporations to take more responsibility into the cleanup of their products or their waste. Oh, you've muted yourself. Sorry, so it's a great question again. I think what you saw, I think in the late, from what, from what I've read is like, I think the latest the negotiations or the latest discussions in, in, the, in the latest negotiations were indeed where you saw that the industry was more pushing towards just looking at waste management and, and recycling as the kind of main strategy of dealing with uh, with the marine plastic pollution right so it becomes a kind of yeah narrower focus if you will right so you can argue it's much more than just waste management and, and waste recycling so you saw the industry kind of maybe shifting more towards let's focus on that kind of strategy to deal with plastics kind of not really maybe not not really kind of getting rid of their own responsibility but kind of pushing it more at the at the end of the of the economic activity, right? So you could argue if, say, coming back to you to your point on should we make them more responsible? Absolutely, we can say let's put a surcharge on uh, instead of having the financial burden at the end where everything is paid through tax money, right? And when when things get into waste management, 
let's um, impose a surcharge um, on the producers while they're producing the plastics so that you kind of shift the financial burden towards um, the, the, the first end that is in the, in the first part of the production phase. So there's plenty of ways economically you can think about how you're going to, to kind of um, yeah, impose responsibilities um, economically uh, across these different economic uh, actors. Um, and producers have definitely their own responsibility. I think there's also discussions about extended producer responsibility types of, 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 of arrangements. I want to highlight, I think there is no silver bullet strategy or, or um, means on how to go about plastics pollution. I think you need to have a, an array and mix of instruments and, 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 and rules and regulations that, that, that apply, ranging from, say, banning the very, talk about microplastics and, and the chemicals that you use. There are some chemicals which are pretty bad. You could say, well, let's let's ban those very environmentally harmful uh, pollutants, right? Um, and then you have other strategies for other ways of, of dealing with plastics. Uh, voluntary measures, behavioral interventions, subsidies, taxes, subsidies, uh, bans, as I mentioned, um, extended producer responsibilities. I think you need a mix of, of, of arrangements. And I think this is also where you want to leave it up to individual countries on how to go about plastics pollution. You should kind of have some kind of overall target that you agree upon, but then you need to leave it up to individual countries on how they want to regulate it and how you want to, how you want to, how you, how you want to go about reducing uh, plastic emissions. But whereas for me in terms of a regulatory intervention might not be working for you, for example, right? So you need to have some kind of flexibility there, I think economically speaking. Okay, so I do have more questions. Obviously, a lot, we well, we covered a lot, um, but I do want to give other people a chance to ask some questions. So I will say, does anyone have any questions uh, in the chat uh, or want to raise the hand and unmute themselves? Please feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, if not, no one's rushing towards it, but um, okay, so I guess then coming back to, again, keeping with the theme of, of responsibility, and you, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the initial was OW, I can't remember what that stood for, but essentially international waters, where actually there could be a lot of these giant whirlpool of spinning plastics. Where, as far as negotiations and treaties stand, who is responsible for that cleanup and what is politically uh, in policy, what is the approach to that? Or is that kind of still a bit of an unknown? From what I gather, it's a bit of an unknown, but it's also a bit of a hot potato because there is no law uh, that applies to uh, these kinds of international. And so I think from what I understand, but I'm not fully, fully, uh, fully sure. So I'm just speculating here a bit. But from, what, from how I see it is that once you go beyond the exclusive economic zones, in these international waters, the pro there's no property rights really, so nobody owns that. So, which means that okay, who's in the end who's responsible for that? Right? So, um, and what does this imply if nobody owns those international waters? It's like, how do, can you carve out incentives to kind of reducing your 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 plastic emissions to deal with those plastics that in the long run end up say in these five international gyres where. Um, who owns that? There, there's no property rights. There's no incentive actually to to deal with that. So, I think so far that issue has been relatively um, been underlighted in the in the negotiations. Uh, I I'm not aware of, of a lot of discussions on that. It, it's mainly around the um, the plastics that we can actually uh, see and measure, right? And I think this is brings us back to the. Uh, point of why it's so important, and I think this is also why it's important for having a potentially successful um, outcome in terms of international agreements, is that you need to have an understanding of how the cost and benefits are shared across space. You need to have an understanding of how much plastics move come from, say, the UK, and how much of the plastics move to Norway, and how much of the plastics move to the US, for example. So the the the, the distribution of the plastics movement and how this goes about over time and, and across space matters for the long run outcome. I need to understand how much 
you are responsible for in terms of pollution, at least to some degree, right? There's always some uncertainty, of course, but um, I was having uh, meetings with the Norwegians. I'm working with Norwegians uh, in the past couple of years. And, uh, and just and just it's just an anecdotal uh, story, but they're saying, hey, we see a lot of plastics on our shores that come from the UK and especially the buoyant types of plastics. You can see if, right, if you can you can you can see where, where it was uh, produced and you can track down what the what kind of the source of the of the pollution is actually. So they're saying, hey, a lot of the plastics that enters on Norwegian shores comes from the UK. Right? So they have a bit of an, yeah, they look badly towards the UK. So listen, you need to kind of do something about it, right? But if most of my plastics from the, are moving away from the UK, I don't really incur um, the damages from that, right? It's Norwegians who have a huge incentive to, to clean up. And this is actually what they're doing. So they're incurring the cost. Uh, and of course, in, if you if they get to a kind of negotiation table, you want to have some understanding of how that dynamic of uh, of damages and, and 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 potential benefits how this looks like. Um, if you and I want to negotiate on, on on finding some kind of cooperative way on on, on reducing our shared, um, yeah, shared I emissions. Guess yeah, so I, I guess as well with that, there is the the slight issue that, of, of course, ocean plastics affect us all and affect every country. It affects some countries more than others, but some countries are more well suited in terms of their their net worth. That net worth's the wrong word there, but in terms of the finances that they have to to apply to that problem. Um, I do see someone's on turn their camera on. Is there a a question? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you very much. Uh, Mark Hartle here at Watson University in Edinburgh. Um, I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. And I just wanted to come into your comment about uh, the source of plastic and uh, it's not necessarily the same place as where it ends up. Um, what I think we what we haven't mentioned here is is where it's actually used. It might be produced, let's say, in the UK or in Norway or in, in China or wherever but it's going to be used possibly somewhere else and enters the marine environment at that point, potentially. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, you can you can establish the source of production, but not necessarily the source of entry into the into the marine environment. And that's a big, big problem uh, yeah. to, to try and solve. I think it's, it's a great point. I think it reinforces the kind of uh, delicacy about how you plan out the, the negotiations, right? Because again, taking the example of the Netherlands, for example, the, I know that a lot of the plastic emissions exit the Dutch rivers into the North Sea. But I also know that a lot of the plastics already happen elsewhere in Central Europe and through the right through the rivers. Subsequently, they they and they enter the, the the Netherlands, and then so is it really the Netherlands who's responsible for what is exiting? Not fully, right? So um, yeah, that's that so, is the problem. Yeah, so it it kind of I think it reinforces the 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 challenge of of getting to some kind of agreement, uh, especially those countries who are not uh, uh, adjacent to international waters, such as Central Europe, for example. How do you go about that, right? So I think, especially in the global treaty, where you have, in theory, all the nations together, it's like. No wonder why it's why you often see that the, these these big international uh, treaties don't actually have teeth in the end, right? Regulatory teeth, because um, the stakes are different. It's um, so there. There's a lot of economics uh, at stake, uh, short-term economics um, typically, and trying to shift the burden somewhere else, right? So um, it, it's challenging. But at least at that side, as at least it gives us, I think, the work. Again, definitely shows that okay, you need to have some understanding of the movement of plastics because at least at least at, at the minimum it guides the uh, negotiations to to some degree. Uh, it, it creates trans transparency, uh, uh, I, I think. That's well, a great point indeed. Thanks. <laughs>
So just looking at the, the time, we might have time for one more question if anyone does have a question. Uh, we have had someone that's uh, firstly said that it's a very interesting presentation and have wondered whether or not the presentation can be made available uh, after the talk, which um, if you're happy, then I can actually share this um, presentation with uh, the attendees for today. If anyone would also like this presentation, if you want to just give us a thumbs up or write in the comments, um, or I just send it out to everyone, however you want to do that. Um, but yeah, so as I say, we do have time for one last question. If I don't see any hands going up, so I will I will take the question. So we've spoken a lot about essentially who's responsible, where this is coming from, I guess to kind of finish off, um, what sort of specific incentive or mechanism uh, do you see that's probably the most effective for tackling this plastic pollution problem? So something, is there something that works that, that can actually make these conversations and make these treaty, treaties happen quicker or more effectively? I think, Oh, it's a challenging question. I think ultimately you want to have um, a clear common goal that is transparent, right? And, and and getting an agreement on, okay, who does what? But at least that all, all noses are in the same direction at the same time. So I need, that, that's one. You need to have uh, some deadlines, um, clear deadlines by which you want to reach the, the target. So clarity is, in this sense also matters. Um, but then I think most importantly, at least from an economic perspective, I would say uh, once you have, once you've stamped out a target and a common agreed goal, you need to leave it up to individual countries to 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 implement those strategies that are most um, effective and and also most efficient for those those countries to kind of go about reducing their their their, their plastic burden. And again, as I said, what 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 strategy works for me might not be working for you, right? It's um, maybe, and this is, for example, just to, to take again the example of the industry pushing towards improved waste management systems. Well, at the margin, this 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 definitely could work. But if I'm in a country where I have already a very high standard of, of waste management systems and recycling and these kinds of things, versus a country where that kind of um, technology, uh, let's say, is, has not been developed up to, to to the highest standards, it's that country who can, yeah, can reap a lot of low-hanging fruit from investing in, say, improving waste management systems. While I might have a different way of maybe incentivizing investment in, in, in developing alternatives, right? It's um, not all instruments are equally applicable or, or useful or effective uh, in, in all, all individual countries. So that's why I would leave it up to individual nations to, to find out what, what works best for them. Uh, of course, working towards the common goal and, and the common target that, that has been set. So one uniform goal, but allowing flexibility in terms of uh, strategies and instruments that you want to, that you want to play up and implement. Amazing. Well, Thank you so much. Um, as I say, we are going to come to an end now. Um, so once again, thank you so much for uh, your time today and delivering your talk today. Um, if anyone in the chat has any follow up questions after um, after we close and stop the recording, uh, please feel free to drop us an email and we can share slides and pass on answers. Uh, just before we go, I have shared the link to the next uh, webinar in the Deep Delve, Deep, Delve Deeper series, um, which is on Wednesday, the 28th of February and is uh, all about calcification, ocean certification. Uh, you can find out more details by following that link. So thank you everyone for joining us for the very first of uh, the series of these webinars and hopefully see you again soon. And I'll end it there. Thanks again for the invite. Thanks for everyone for, for, for joining. Pleasure. <laughs>